Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. It's a very special webinar because we're having one of our customers present to us today. Uh, Greg is from Technical Prospects, and we're so excited to hear about his experience as an end user. So we're going to get that started in just a moment here. Just a couple pieces of housekeeping before we get started. First, we do record this and all of our webinars. So if you want to watch it again, if you want to show it to somebody else in your organization, we will have the recording up on our website by the end of the day. And that, of course, is anovia.com. Also, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the question box and we will get them called out and answered for you. So without further ado, Greg, I hand it right over to you. All right, thanks, Abby. So as Abby said, uh, my name is Greg Enns. I'm an in-house developer at Technical Prospects. And uh, so I thought I would start off with just providing a little bit of intro into what Technical Prospects does. Um, kind of an interesting industry. We uh, purchase old CAT scanners and X-ray machines that are still fully working, and we tear them down and sell the parts off to other customers who have uh, the same machines, and theirs have broken down. So. Uh, Pretty interesting. We've uh, we're a family-owned business. I've been here for um, about uh, almost I don't know, eight and a half years now, I think, and uh, done everything here from uh, working in the warehouse to an inventory and uh, receiving and, uh, to moving up into accounting and doing purchasing, uh, AP, and uh, now I manage our uh, inventory from the accounting side, as well as doing uh, NAV development, uh, manage our SQL database, uh, and a variety of other things here. So. That's a little bit about me. Uh, so I think next up would just kind of be giving an outline of what I'm looking to talk about today. And uh, if you'll forgive the scratchiness of my voice, I got a bit of a cold today. <clears throat> so uh, we got three introductions. And uh, next would be starting with just a few uh, basics about the uh, connector. So we'll talk about integration tables, integration events, and then uh, Move into a little bit more uh, advanced talk, talking about uh, how the connector more works and what are three different uh, ways that you can actually uh, use the connector to synchronize records together. Then we move into the fun stuff, uh, what, we're, what really is driving all of this, and that is the uh, tips and tricks and gotchas um, behind the uh, CRM integration with NAV 2016. And then we'll complete with any uh, questions that might come up during the presentation. So um, I guess a little bit of background on how I got into this. Uh, our company purchased uh, Dynamic CRM this year. And uh, we also upgraded our NAV from 2009 RTC to 2016. So uh, immediately following the upgrade, my next big project was to integrate the two systems. And so. We were in the process of going live with CRM, so I had a little bit of uh, a bonus that way in that my CRM was kind of a sandbox for me. Um, but uh, essentially, what we, we, uh, we had to do quite a bit of customization because of some choices we've made in the way that we organize our uh, companies and uh, customers in our NAV database. And we wanted to be able to keep that the same way but still integrate with the way that CRM was going to handle those. So. Uh, made things a little bit more complicated for us, but it also provided as a developer uh, the chance to learn a lot more about how the connector works and find a lot more of the issues that are involved in this. So, um, all right, with no further ado, we'll move into the basics. So, uh, I was at NAVUG Summit 2016 when Microsoft was on stage presenting this. And of course, uh, I, I don't remember if they showed this exact screen, but. Uh, if you uh, watch any of their uh, tutorials or videos or whatever, they take you here and they say, look, type in your credentials and click synchronize. And it works, right? And all the developers in the room go, yeah, right. So uh, I'm a Shaquille O'Neal fan, so there I've got a little picture of him with his uh, yeah, right face. That's, that's the face that I, I had in the, at the uh, summit as I thought, thought about the details behind the scenes and thought it's not going to be that easy. So, But hey, they've got to sell things, right? So that's what they do. Anyway, so uh, <laughs> we're going to get into some of the complicated things behind the scenes here, but it's not this simple. Uh, this is definitely a, a, the place where you want to start, and if you're looking to do a, uh, a demo situation and kind of just check out the connector, um, then their initial setup and the, the default settings that they have are fine, you know, especially for like a Kronos database, if you want to just see how it's working and what all it, it can do. 
then that's certainly a, a good place to start. And it is it is where I started. But uh, so hoping to give you a little bit more information behind the scenes here today, so that uh, you don't have to go into the ground floor like I did. So uh, one of the, my my first misconceptions when I was investigating the CRM uh, connector was I saw all these tables in the object designer for NAV, and I said, hey, look at that. We're going to have all of our CRM accounts, all their data from CRM is going to be stored in NAV in this CRM account table, and all of our contacts and opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. All of that data is going to be in NAV, so if I want to change it, I'll just change it in NAV, you know, and maybe I'll even use, uh, use SQL behind the scenes if I have to. Um, I, yes, that's a no-no, but uh, sometimes things require that as long as we're careful with it. So. Um, I quickly found that uh, if you try to run any of these tables from the object designer, it doesn't work. Um, and the reason is, is that they're simply a false front. They don't hold any data in the NAV database. So it's strictly a definition so that you can work with these tables in Cal code. So uh, in your code, so example, you can have a code unit that is working with the records in the CRM account table, even though that data is stored in the CRM database, whether that's on-premise or whether that's in the cloud. Either way, as long as you have your connector set up, you can write a code unit that manipulates that data, even though that data is not stored inside of the NAV database. Now, that doesn't mean that you can uh, necessarily get there very easily or that it works very quickly, because it is having to go across the connection. Um, so, what data is there stored in the NAV database as far as the connector is concerned? Uh, the first thing I would say is the CRM integration record. This is the only place where you have actual CRM data from their database that is stored in NAV. And the only thing that gets stored is the CRM ID, that's the GUID for the record. So, in, in this example, um, I've labeled this with a custom field. Um, in most of my screenshots, I've got yellow highlighting anything that's a custom field. So just keep that in mind. If you go to run your CRM integration record table, you won't see this field. Uh, but you can see that it's table ID 5050. That's the contact table. Um, and we've synced the contact table to an account. So I know that this is the GUID for an account in CRM. The integration ID is a link. And that link takes me to the NAV record. The NAV record information for the connector is stored in the integration record table. The integration record stores data for all uh, NAV records that could potentially get synced. So when you set up the connector, um, there's a specific code unit where you define and say, these are the tables that I'm going to sync to CRM. And when you do that, NAV takes every single record in that table in all the, each of those tables, and it inserts it into the integration record table. And in here, you get the record ID. You get the integration ID so that you can link it to the CRM integration record. And you also get a modified on or deleted on that tells you the last time that this record was modified um, and, or, and or deleted. Again, custom fields over here. Um, so we'll talk about those later. So there's the basics of uh, kind of the back end of the integration. A little bit more on this. So to define your specific tables, yes, you sp specify them in a code unit, but you also need to set up a table mapping and a field mapping. So at the table mapping level, what we're doing here is we're setting up what are the filters that we want to use, and we're also telling the uh, connector very specifically that this nav table table number four, which is the NAV currency table, is going to be synced up to the CRM, which is anytime you see integration table or integration field, that's always referring to the CRM field or CRM table. So in this case, the CRM table is numbered 5345. If we look at the, for, for me, I've got the company relates to the account and 5341. And if I go back to this list, 5341 is the CRM account. So 5341 is the CRM table ID for CRM account, and I have that syncing up to the NAV contact table. Uh, the default uh, setup and really the recommended way, I would say, for doing this is to take your customer's list, not your company's, but your customer's list and sync it to uh, CRM accounts 
and take your people contacts from table 50 and synchronize those to 5342, which is CRM contacts. That's the way that NAV expects you to do it. That's the way that the connector is set up to operate. And if you want to do anything different than that, which is what I've done here, you notice I have the uh, 50, table 5050, the NAV contact table, synced up to one, two, three, four, uh, sorry, just three different tables in CRM. That is not the way that the connector is stock set up to work. So if you want to do that where you have a one to end mapping like I've done here, expect to uh, have to do a lot of customizing and code. Um, and uh, it certainly works. I can attest to that. Uh, the connector can handle it, but uh, you're going to have to write some custom code to make the to make sure that the connector works the way you want it to work. Um, a few other things in here in the integration table mapping. Uh, anything that really that makes that's real key here is uh, I think we're going to talk about later the table filters. Uh, so we've got the integration table filters, and there's also a a standard table filter field, which I don't think I have on this screenshot. It's, here it is right here. So all those things, uh, different things, a little bit more complicated, I'm not going to get into it here in the basics section. So we'll touch on a couple of them later. Uh, integration field mapping is where we actually set up and say, OK, so for specific tables within that table mapping, then there's a list of fields that we're going to map from one table to the next. So um, for example, in the uh, company to account mapping that we have, I want to map the company name and I want to map the address. So address one goes to CRM address one and address two goes to CRM address two. Those sorts of things all happen down here in the field mapping. And this is the simplest way to just tell it to push data back and forth. And you can see here that not everything has to go both directions. You can go one direction, and that could be either to integration table, which means to CRM, or from integration table, which would be from CRM, or you go bi-directional. I think that's enough on the connector basics. The last piece of connector basics, actually, is our integration events. So with NAV 2016, Microsoft uh, introduced events. And... Um, all developers said yay, and uh, everybody who has to upgrade said yay. Um, and if you uh, haven't had a chance to work with events, the and you're looking at doing working on the NAV connector, then you'll definitely get very familiar with events. This was my introduction, and uh, I'm a big fan of them. Uh, I think they're very good, uh, and I think they're very useful. And in the CRM connector, they are essentially what you will use to write your code. So. Um, these are the different integration events. Uh, I'm actually going to start with the bottom because these are pretty simple. On, before, modify. So when you're taking a record and you're modifying, uh, say, say for example, there was a user made a change to a NAV record and you want to push those changes to CRM, then these would happen on, after, modify of the CRM record, on, before, modify of the CRM record, or if you're inserting because maybe somebody inserted a new record into uh, NAV and that record needs to get pushed over to CRM, then these are the ones that would happen there. The on before transfer fields and on after transfer fields, um, as noted here, is just related to the field mappings. So there's a stock um, a loop, I guess, that, that pushes through each of the field mappings for a specific table mapping and says, OK, we need to push all these fields over. And you can run these events before you do the transfer fields or after the transfer of fields. This top one here is probably the most important one, and it's, a, it's also a little bit tricky. The unquery post filter ignore record allows us to ignore records in either system from being synced or coupled based on code. So what that means is in the uh, integration table mapping, we have filters that we can set up. So you can say, I only want to uh, synchronize accounts or customers that have uh, this field uh, you know, checked. So maybe you want to have a Boolean field in your customer that you're going to mark. And you say, OK, these are the ones that I'm going to synchronize. And only when that gets marked do I synchronize it. So you could set that up in the table mapping. But not all filters are necessarily that simple of where you can just set it up with a, a standard filter. So um, if it's not that simple, then what you want to do is 
deal with it in the onquery post filtering or record event. So in there, you can go out and you can check, say for example, you wanted to look at a customer and say, do they have any sales in the last week? You know, okay, then I will go ahead and push them. Or, you know, do they have it? You can check other records and things like that that would be uh, related to the record you're, you're considering syncing. And when this event happens, there is a Boolean uh, called in there that you can switch and just say, nope, I want to ignore this record. And as soon as you do that in your subscription to that event, then the connector will skip the record that it's currently on and move on to the next record and, and try to sync that one. So, um, also got a list here of the default subscriptions that they have that uh, Microsoft wrote to subscribe to these different serum events. And you'll notice that uh, what they essentially did is, you know, the on before modify event is going to run for every table that gets synced. Um, and but but in each of these events, they're going to decide and, and check and say, okay, I wrote this event specifically for if we're updating a serum account, uh, or let's see, let's do a uh, well, okay, so uh, update a serum account after transfer record fields. So that's going to be up here on after transfer fields. And so the update of the serum account, the first thing that they do in that event is check: Are you updating a serum account, or are you updating a serum contact? If you're updating a serum contact, then it's going to skip right past this one as soon as it does the check and say, nope, that's not me, and it exits. It'll move on to the serum contact and says, are you updating a serum contact? Oh, yes, you are. Okay, execute my code. So it's a simple if statement at the beginning of each of the events that just checks to see um, which type of record is being synced, and that allows us to separate the different events into different functions so that we can separate our code more easily. Okay, so once we've got all of uh, the filters and uh, mappings all set up, then we want to actually get into the fun stuff of where we're actually coupling records or syncing records. Uh, I use those two terms interchangeably. Uh, typically, uh, Microsoft refers to it as coupling uh, two records together, and it just means that you're taking a record in NAV and um, a record in CRM, and you're making sure that whatever fields are supposed to be um, linked together are actually matching, and that they have the same data. So you can do this, uh, you can sync two records um, at the actual record level, and you can do it in the uh, user's um, GUI. So say, for example, you're on the list of contacts. In the list of contacts, up in the action pane, if you go to the Navigate tab in NAV 2016, um, and I think NAV 2017 is the same, but I haven't taken a look yet. Uh, but they've got a whole section on for specific functions that you can run related to the connector. Uh, the first one would be very simple and self-explanatory, view in CRM. Um, as long as everything is set up the way that it should be, you click on that button, it's going to open up your browser, and it'll take you right to the record that it is that is linked to the record you have highlighted in the list. Or if you're on a card page, the same thing applies. It's going to take you right to the record there. Uh, synchronize now. What this does is this is going to run a synchronization strictly for the record you have highlighted. If you have multiple records highlighted, it does do that. I don't recommend that, though. Um, it changes some settings when they do that. So you can run it for a single record just by clicking Synchronize Now. Um, I, I actually was just doing this this morning for a user. Uh, the user called and said, hey, I noticed that this field, uh, it says this in NAV, and it should be this, and it should be that in CRM as well. So I updated it, and I quickly clicked Synchronize Now, and I knew that it would push the changes right away. Uh, coupling. The coupling is another way to do the synchronization, and it's more of a, a manual process. So Synchronize Now is just going to quickly just run the sync for you. If you're looking to actually set up a coupling and say, okay, I know there's a record in uh, CRM, and I'm wanting to link it to this record in NAV, then the setup coupling is what you're going to be going for here. And the setup coupling page, you can actually uh, click a drop down that will show you a list of all the CRM records that you can um, synchronize your NAV record to. So uh, this is particularly useful in the initial setup of the connector because before you do any of the big synchronization of the more uh, advanced tables like the uh, customer table or the contact table or your sales invoices, things like that, 
Um, before you're going to do any of that, you're going to want to synchronize things like currency, uh, your salespeople. That salesperson purchaser table needs to be synced up against the system user table in CRM. And those users, because if you have a CRM database, you've probably already got users in it, you're going to need to do each of them manually using this setup coupling. NAV does not have any way for it to automatically look and say, oh, that NAV user, that NAV salesperson matches up to this user in CRM, and it just automatically knows that doesn't happen. You have to manually say, I have this salesperson, and I want it linked up to this user in CRM. And you do that through the setup coupling on the salesperson purchaser page. Uh, creating. If you have a record in NAV and you just say, oh, I want to go push this and create this over in CRM, you can do that with this Create button. One thing to be aware of um, with this process, so this is, uh, again, in the GUI and it's a manual process. Um, when you're doing this, this process is not going to respect any of the filters set in either the table mapping or the on-query post-filter event. So if there are specific records that you don't want synced, you need to know that it is possible for someone to go to that record in NAV and click on the synchronize now or create in CRM or set up coupling, all of these things, and it could create, they could create a coupling that would then get synced in the future. So um, just something to be aware of. And the final thing is that it gets executed as the current user. Now, for the stock setup, that's not a problem because, excuse me, um, the NAV connector doesn't um, we'll talk more about this later, but the NAV connector doesn't uh, really care what the user ID is on the NAV side. So, but if um, if you choose to follow a customization that I recommend, and we'll talk about it later again, then this could be a problem, is executing these as a current user. You need to be aware of what you're doing and know what the fallout could be from that. All right, so that's the first way you can synchronize or couple records. Let's talk about number two. Number two, and this is honestly my uh, recommended way of synchronizing records, but it is, uh, when you do this, you are doing it for every record in a specific table. So that was at the record level. This is at the table level. So here, you're going to the integration table mappings table, and you can pull this up on a page in NAV. And in here, you can uh, simply click on the synchronize modified records. That is the way that I would recommend doing this uh, procedure. Still, there's some caveats here. It does get executed as the current user. So as we talked about before, that could be a problem for you if you are worried about users on the NAV side and which user is doing the synchronization. Um, one quick note, do not do this run full synchronization. I have a big X through it, and I do not recommend that you use it. If you do this run full synchronization, it's going to take some of your settings in here, like, for example, this sync only modified records checkbox, and it's going to reset them all to blank, and it's going to essentially synchronize everything. So every record in your NAV database that is set to be synced and has a table mapping, it's going to push it to CRM. And if CRM has any records, it's going to take all of those records and push them into NAV as new records. So most likely, if you have a case of a CRM database that has records and a NAV database that has records, then you don't want that to happen because then you're going to have duplicates in both databases. So do not use the run full synchronization unless you have a pretty much empty CRM database and you're just pushing all of your data from NAV into there. And that includes currencies, salespeople, units of measure. Those are the three key things that you've got to have. I think there might be a couple of others. I just didn't need them. Read through the Microsoft documentation before you do any kind of synchronizing on this page and be aware. Particularly avoid this one. One thing I added to this page that I would recommend is the integration field mappings. Uh, you'll notice I had it up here, and on the main page I've got it here, integration field mappings. The integration field mappings, uh, that button is custom, and it uh, links to a custom page that I created. For some reason, Microsoft felt that it wasn't needed to have a page to show the field mappings. Um, I thought that was an oversight, so I said I want a page. I made a page for myself, and I linked it here so that when I'm on a specific table mapping and I want to see the fields that are being mapped on that table mapping, I can click right here, and it's going to take me right to the list of fields filtered to that table mapping. 
uh, this other column here that's in yellow, I just simply created a numbering sequence so that these would get numbered in the order that I want. Uh, that's all that they are, and I just made sure the page was ordered by this field. So that's all that's going on. The third way to synchronize, and this is kind of the uh, a holy grail, if you will, of uh, integration between NAV 2016 and Sierra. When, uh, when what you're probably going to want to get to if you're setting this up is that you want to get to where the job queue is running this for you. Um, we, we certainly don't want, most of the time, you're probably not going to want people having to manually sync every time they make a change in, uh, in either database. So the job queue is exactly what the uh, integration is all about. And um, so some things to just note here. In the job queues, um, this is my job queue that runs to run all of our uh, CRM jobs. I don't have a filter on it. I've considered putting a uh, CRM filter here so that I could have a specific job queue just to run the CRM integration. But I haven't done that at this point because I haven't seen a necessity for it. Um, down in the job queue entries, you can see that we have a single entry, company, person, CSR alert, site company, lead, interaction. These names, you'll notice, all match up to these names. So for every table mapping you have, if you want the job queue to run it, you've got to have a job queue entry going on here. Um, the NAV default setup that they run or they recommend that you run creates these. It creates uh, the it creates the table mappings based on what they expect that you'll probably want, and then it creates a job queue entry for each of those table mappings. If you add any uh, additional table mappings, it does not automatically create a job queue. So uh, I recommend, and this is what I did, is created essentially an event for on insert or on delete of the integration table mappings, a job queue entry gets created or deleted so that there's always a matching one to match up to the table mapping. In the job queue entry, there is a field that identifies um, the ID of these. So there's a, uh, a GUID, I believe it is, that is the ID for each of these table mappings. And so that GUID needs to be on these records so that it knows which one of the table mappings it's supposed to run. Uh, the user ID that gets that is running the job queue is your service tier um, user ID. So just one thing to keep that in mind, and that whatever user ID is set up on your service tier, that's the one that's going to be running your job queue. So that will be the user ID. Um, that is going to be doing all of the updates. So if the job queue sees a change in CRM and it pushes that change into NAV, then the, uh, the changes will be made by the user ID of that's running the job queue. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. Um, so we'll move on from there. I guess before I get into the real uh, fun stuff, the heart of our uh, presentation, do we have any questions or comments? Abby, just wanted to check with you. We do not have any questions as of yet, Greg. Okay, perfect. Well, I'll move into the real fun stuff then. So, customizing your connector, tips and gotchas. And uh, if you read through the blog that I wrote on this, basically I'm just going to be touching on each of the points that I had listed in there and uh, providing a little bit more explanation in some cases or uh, really just reviewing what was in the blog there. So, uh, very first thing, uh, this slide can be a little bit overwhelming to look at, but it's, uh, it's, it's necessary in order to understand um, what you need to do if you're going to add a new table. So, for example, CRM has accounts, contacts, and leads, and that's where your people and companies are typically stored the lead table is not stock integrated into NAV. So you'll notice that I, the very first table that I added was the lead table and I wanted to customize that and so it has to be in the 50,000 range because it is a custom table that I created in NAV and I did that custom table so that we could integrate to it. And the only way that we could do that is by following this whole process. 
So uh, you got to do this in the development shell, and the development shell runs on your uh, NAV server. So uh, do check out the Microsoft documentation. I've got that listed here, and it's also in the blog. Um, but be aware that their documentation of what this uh, command needs to be is kind of poor. So I would recommend using this one, particularly their um, explanation of what you need to do for credentials to get into the CRM database and to be able to access and get the information needed um, is, is poor. So uh, the stuff in yellow here is what I've customized. So these are customized entities. You notice they're all 50,000 range. Uh, I synchronized the CRM lead, email, phone call task, and annotation tables into uh, NAV so that we could push data back and forth between those. Uh, in red are the things that you're going to have to change in order for this to work for you. So obviously uh, your CRM URL goes here, whatever that looks like. If your CRM URL is not .crm.dynamics.com, then certainly adjust all of that. But I think that's kind of the stock default one that they set up. Um, to get access, you need to have a user ID, and I believe that user ID has to be a system administrator, so be aware of that. And that's, again, on the CRM side. Uh, what this process is going to do is take each of these numbers and create the, uh, a text file object for, uh, that will be corresponding to the CRM table and then you can import those text files into your NAV database and they'll become your false fronts. So the 5340 and all of these other ones here are um, tables that are already existing in there. And so you might say, well, Greg, why are you creating all of these in addition to creating these? And the reason is, is that the only objects that I really want are these ones that are in yellow. Those are the only ones that I really needed. But these objects have relations have fields that are related back to some of these tables. And so if I don't include these other tables that are stock and that I'm already happy with the, uh, the definitions, then I won't get the, uh, the, the relations won't be set up correctly and so the tables won't work as well. Um, and in some cases they won't work at all. So anytime you're using this process, don't shrink the list. Just keep, what I've done is I just keep this in a standard place, and anytime I add another table to it, then I update my, um, my documentation so that I have, I'm always using the same thing. And yes, it means that the process takes maybe a minute or two longer than it would otherwise, but it's worth it because you need all of that information, and otherwise your, your uh, objects, when you try to import them into NAV, will not work. Um, the other piece is, is if you make any changes, Say, for example, 5340 is the CRM account table. If you make a change in CRM, and maybe you add a couple of fields in CRM, and then you need to be able to work with those fields in the connector, you're going to have to run this entire process in order to get an updated version of 5340. Don't just try and add the field in uh, NAV. I don't believe that that works. I'm pretty sure I tried that and it failed. Um, if it does work, then um, please leave a comment in, on the blog. Uh, and explain your process if it was anything uh, complicated at all. But I'm pretty sure that that doesn't work. So what I've been doing is I just run this entire process. I take the updated version of 5340 and I merge it against the current version that I have in my database. So the reason you got to do the merge is that um, those new fields you added, although uh, Although in NAV, we're used to just being able to provide a field number and then it just goes in a specific place and the organization always stays the same, this process does not respect the current definition of 5340. So it renumbers all of the fields. Every time you run this process, if you've added a field, then all the fields, wherever it gets inserted in alphabetical order, all the fields after it will have their field numbers changed. So that's why merging is important. You don't want to be changing the NAV field numbers for the fields that are already existing. So uh, makes for a little bit of a complicated merge process anytime that you're looking to update one of these tables. So I would recommend um, <laughs> trying to update them all at once if you are, you know, accumulating a few different updates all together. Um, otherwise, you're just going to be dealing with merging, merging stuff, which isn't too complicated, but it can be a little bit of a pain. Uh, lastly here, for creating a new integration table and doing all of that, I've created kind of a shorthand to-do list. And this is, this is the to-do list I 
use um, for whenever I'm doing one of these. These are the things that you're going to want to be checking. Not all of them may necessarily be necessary. Particularly, um, you'll notice I made a mark between anything that was a one to n table mapping. Um, again, that's not something the connector is set up to handle by default. So if you want to do a one to n table mapping where you've got one table in either database that is mapped to um, multiple tables in the other database, um, you're going to need to make changes in uh, these specific places where I've got the one to n table mappings noted. So uh, this is just kind of a general guide. Uh, the Microsoft documentation on doing this is actually pretty good uh, as far as walking you through each of the various different steps. So I would definitely recommend reading this article and walking your way through that as you do your, at least you do your first one. All right. Next tip. In the, uh, when you're working with a connector, there are four different modified fields. And um, <laughs> it can be a little bit confusing because the naming scheme that they use um, for two of them is <laughs> not very self-explanatory. So we talked about how the integration record holds a modified on date. And what that tells us is the last date with that specific record was modified. Very self-explanatory. Also, in CRM, there is a modified field for every record in the CRM database. And they were very smart and <laughs> actually named them all exactly the same. They're all named modified on. So that makes it very easy to find the modified on date for a CRM record. However, where it gets a little bit more complicated is NAV also stores the last date when um, a record was synced in either direction. And it, the, diff the, directional, um, the direction is saved in a specific place. So um, we have a last sync modified on. And these are stored in the CRM integration record. The last sync modified on is when, NAV, when a NAV record was last synced to CRM. So that's the direction of NAV pushing to CRM. And that's the last time that for that record, this, this happened. So the last time that record was pushed into CRM. Last sync CRM modified on. That's the exact opposite. So when was the last time that CRM record was changed and the connector pushed those changes to the coupled NAV record? So if, um, if you have a case of where you're only pushing information one direction, so let's say you're pushing data only from NAV into CRM for a specific table mapping, then all of those CRM records that are getting updated by NAV changes in the CRM integration record table, this field here should be blank because it, they've never been synced back to NAV. They've only been synced one direction, so this field would always be blank. So if that doesn't make sense, I, I just have to, uh, that's the best I could really do. Here's how I've named them for myself. Um, nav modified, last nav sync, last CRM sync, and CRM modified. Um, so you'll see that on a, on a future slide here. I'll show you where that, where I put that. But uh, anyways, let's move on. So uh, our next tip, the integration errors table. Oh, and here it is. So here's those four fields that I put. So in the integration errors uh, table, this is where NAV logs any time that it's trying to sync two records together and it finds that something goes wrong. Um, there will be times when just the connection drops out. Maybe your internet connection drops or the CRM database is um, being having maintenance procedures run or something like that. And so then you have uh, a situation where you can't, um, you can't, the, the connector is not able to complete the operation of syncing the two records together. So whenever that happens, um, then the connector is going to insert a uh, sync error into this error log. And in the error log, um, and I haven't, unfortunately, I didn't highlight my custom fields in here, and I apologize for that. Um, but the thing that I would recommend here, and this is why this is a tip, is that a lot of times you'll find that um, in the error log, you'll get a record shows up multiple times. And maybe it'll show up once, and then somebody will fix it. And you have no record that that record got um, updated and that it's been resolved. 
So what I recommend putting in here is I've added this custom field. It's a Boolean. Um, it's not editable. Uh, it's called resolved. And what I did is I created a function called mark previous sync errors as resolved. And so what this does is that anytime a sync is successful, what it does is it goes and checks and says, hey, are there any error logs out there for these records? These records, maybe we tried to sync before and they failed. Well, I just did it. I was successful. That means we don't need to do it anymore. This isn't an error any further. And so what we do is we mark them as resolved. And so that's what this function does. I highly recommend that you do something like this, um, particularly as you're doing troubleshooting things, because otherwise you'll see all kinds of error logs and things that show up in here. Um, there's even cases where uh, if you're doing a synchronization manually and you're doing it at the record level in the GUI, then uh, there's a warning message that the connector will throw up at some point and say, hey, you know, it looks like both of your records have probably been modified since the last time we synced these two together. Are you sure that you want to run the synchronization because you might end up overwriting records? When that error message comes up, even if you move past and say, yes, I am sure, it's still going to create an error log in here. And so if you don't have a resolve checkbox, then you're going to say, yes, I want it to synchronize these, even though it might overwrite changes. And it'll come back and it'll tell you, hey, it was successful. Your synchronization is done. But then if you go to your error log, you'll see an error in here for those two records. If you don't have the resolve checkbox, then you won't know that that error has been resolved. And you'll think that, oh, maybe I need to do that again. And so anyways, you can end up on a, a nasty revolving wheel there. So. I highly recommend this resolve checkbox, and where this becomes useful is every time I go in and check my error log, which I do about once or twice a week, I'll go in there and I'll filter on resolved equals yes, and then I'll do this delete all entries. And it, it, this, these delete entries really should be um, updated because they don't, um, they don't actually delete all entries. They delete the entries that are shown. So whatever you have filtered, on the error log integration sync page, these delete functions will respect those filters. So if you set a filter of resolved equals yes, and you say delete all entries, it'll go through, it'll delete all of your uh, error logs that are already marked as resolved. You can clear your error, and then any ones that aren't resolved will be left in the window, and then you can handle those, because then you know that those are the ones you actually need to fix. Okay, here's my favorite gotcha of the entire integration. And by favorite, I mean most complicated, and um, <laughs> it's, it's comical actually because in the in one of the code units that you'll probably see as you're diving into this, you'll notice that there's a comment from Microsoft where they say, "Future update, we should add a the ability to check the modified on uh, or the modified by in Nav to see who modified it in Nav." And the reason is, is that, and I've written this out here because if I tried to explain it just off the cuff, it, it wouldn't be good. So the NAV connector does not know when it was the one who modified the NAV record with changes from CRM. So the result of that means that any change in CRM is going to get pushed to NAV. Okay, so to right there, we're good. That's what we want to have happen. If somebody changes something in CRM, we want it to get pushed to NAV. But the problem is, is that the connector doesn't know that it was the one that made those changes in NAV. So the next time that table mapping on the job queue runs, it's going to look at that record and say, hey, look, there's changes. I need to push these changes back to CRM. Well, that's definitely not what we want. When a change happens in CRM, it should get pushed to NAV and it should stop. It should not get pushed back to CRM. So what we have to do is essentially um, create a definition or add some code so that the uh, connector knows that if it's user ID, um, and you'll see right down here, I've actually hard coded the user ID that our job queue runs under. And I said, if the integration record is modified by this user ID, exit out of here false. So in other words, tell the connector that this record has not been modified since the last time. It does not need to get pushed back to CRM. So that's what this is all about. For more information on this, I'd recommend that you just email me or um, read through my blog and make sure you get all the information there. Most of the stuff in the blog I think I've put on here. Um, but there's a number of different places you're going to need to do this um, and where you're going to want to 
add the modified by. So in the different slides, you've probably seen some places where I had the modified by uh, filter on there, and that's what this was all for, is, is to handle this issue. So if you get nothing else out of this uh, webinar, I recommend you get that. So we'll move on because I'm running short on time. Syncing option fields. Uh, if you're going to work with the connector, chances are you're going to have some option fields. So when you're doing that, just one thing to be aware of, this is pretty simple. Um, the first option in, NAV, in CRM should be a 1, and that's going to equivalent to this. So if you have an option field in CRM, you want it to be 1, 2, etc. In NAV, we have 0 is the blank. And the blank is what the uh, unassigned value is or the null value in CRM refers to. So if you have option fields, if you can set them up like this, where this is number one and this is number two, then you're more likely to uh, be successful with getting those to sync automatically just using a field mapping. If you aren't able to set them up this way, then you're going to want to do uh, handle these with code in the after transfer fields event. So in the after transfer fields event, you'll have the uh, record from CRM and the record from NAV, and you can say, hey, I want you to take this and push it to this record, and here's how we're going to set it up. And so you can do the whole thing with code that way. Next tip, when you're ready to uh, move live, so let's say, for example, you've been working in the sandbox, you've got your connector, you're very happy with it, and now it's time to move all of your data from uh, your test database in NAV to your live database in NAV. One of the things you're going to need to do is move all your table mappings. The way that I recommend doing that is, um, or one way I guess I could say, there's probably many different ways that you could do this, but one way that I found worked well for me is I would actually just copy and paste all the rows. So I would highlight all the rows here and I would copy rows and I'd paste them into a text file. And then I would go to my live database and I would paste the rows. Or if I'm just updating one, so for example, I think in my original connector I only had one through seven here, and since then I've added eight and nine. So when I was adding eight and nine, I would just copy row eight and I would paste row eight into my live database. The one thing that doesn't work there is the table filter or the integration table filter, which we can't see on this page. The uh, table filter is easiest copied from one database to another using this SQL code. So yes, SQL is um, you know, not, not a preferred way to deal with a NAV database, but in this case it's safe, it works, and it's what I would recommend. Because um, otherwise you're going to be opening up this page and you're going to be filling in everything manually and then you're going to be error prone. Chances are you might miss something, forget something, um, mistype, that's not what you want. So if you use SQL, you can take the uh, test table filter and copy it right over to the live table filter. So here's some example code to do that with. Uh, another thing here, the job log. So every time that the uh, an integration table mapping is uh, synced, whether it's done in the integration table mapping field or even at the record level, um, or if the job queue does it, the job log for the integration sync will record a, uh, a record here. I have not figured out why these are not always correct. Sometimes they're right. So what these should say is account to contact and then contact, or sorry, contact to account and then account to contact. And the reason is, is that when the connector runs, if it's a bi-directional connection, then it always starts with nav to CRM and then it goes CRM to nav. I don't know why these direction fields get um, aren't getting corrected and listed the right way. So if you find that yours is not, it doesn't do that and it's just mine, well then, too bad for me. Um, if you do find the answer and you get a solution uh, and you find that this is a problem in your system as well, please post it in the comments so that uh, I can change it in my system. I'd love to get it fixed, but I haven't taken the time to find the problem yet. Here is another um, gotcha. So uh, in the manual sync, so when you're doing a record level sync, uh, which the most common time that you'll find you're doing a record level sync is when you're just correcting an error from the error log. When you're doing a record level sync, 
you will find that um, the default is hard-coded to always be from NAV to CRM. And in some cases, that's not what you want. And so what I found is that I, I wanted the default direction to be based upon which record was modified more recently. And so I created this code unit and I um, inserted it into uh, 5330 so that it would um, reset the default to be whatever uh, was the most recent is going to get pushed to the, push those new changes to the older version of the record. So whichever way it needs to go, then it tells me that. And I love it because now whenever I click sync, I know that it's coming up and it's telling me, hey, this is the way you should do it. And I don't have to worry about it. I can click OK and move forward. So I highly recommend that. Here's another fun one. This is probably my second favorite finding in, um, in this uh, integration. So when you run the stock integration, if you have a table that's got a lot of um, records that are synced together, you'll notice that the nav to CRM sync might take a couple of seconds. Um, if there's a lot of record changes, then it could take a while. But typically, when just about everything is synced, and, and especially if there's no changes, uh, in the nav side that need to be pushed to CRM, it'll take a second, maybe or two seconds, to run the entire table and say, yep, we're good. Conversely, in the opposite direction. So as soon as it finishes that, it makes the job log record, and you can see that it took about half a second to run all that, and it knows that it's good. Now it goes to CRM, and it says, okay, CRM, do you have any records that you need to push? And sometimes, like for example, in one of our tables, we found that this took 20 minutes. So half a second compared to 20 minutes. That was horrible. So um, diving into the code, you'll find that there is a section in here in code unit 5340 that's kind of a cleanup routine. And what it's doing is it's cleaning up the CRM integration record table to find any records in there that are in the CRM integration record table in the NAV database, but perhaps no longer exist in the CRM database. If those are there, it's going to run a cleanup to get rid of those. Now, I don't expect that that's going to happen very often. So what I wrote is I just added some hard-coded stuff in here to figure out and make sure that this cleanup process is only going to run between midnight and 6 a.m. So for, for me, that's kind of our off hours of our building. I would recommend that you maybe even set this to be a shorter time frame. For me, this was fine. Run it between the, those and make sure that the cleanup is actually happening and it's good. So something to be aware of there because that was, that was quite the uh, nightmare for me for a while. Another tip here. Um, I know a lot of developers maybe don't work a whole lot in the RTC environment, uh, in the user GUI, but if you do, which I do because I'm both a user and a developer, um, I would highly recommend making a button on your role center for the CRM integration management. Um, so I've actually got mine, uh, it's called CRM Connector Management, and this is what I have on there. So anytime I need to deal with the CRM Connector, I go right to this button, and I've got everything that I need to worry about. So you've got all the stuff that, you've got your tables that you're synchronizing. Um, I've got a couple of other tables up above, this, above these. You've got right access to your integration table mappings. You can check your job queues, make sure those are running. Check your job queue entries, make sure there's no errors that they're holding up and hanging. Go to your job log if you need to, or more commonly, you're going to your error log to see if there's any errors that you need to clean up. So highly recommend doing that. Um, these are some custom pages that I've added for myself, um, but that's uh, my recommendation as to what that might look like for you. Uh, last one here, last tip, and I mentioned this at the beginning, is um, you know when, when you, uh, in our NAV database, we're used to being able to do a variety of different things with code and being able to run uh, different uh, functions or tasks, and whether it's with a job queue or whether it's with uh, just you know executing a code unit uh, ad hoc. I do that from time to time. And we have a CRM in the cloud, and so I found that that can be a little bit of a challenge where I don't have access to the database uh, from the back side. So one thing that has been useful is that I can have a code unit that references CRM tables that I have synchronized or that I've brought into my NAV database, and I can do all sorts of different things. 
Um, one thing to be aware of, this was something I was trying to make happen. We're dealing with the created by and the modified by and the modified on and different things like that. This didn't work so great just because the uh, CRM logic overrides the modified by and the modified on. Um, but just an example of you can do all kinds of different things and modify, delete, insert records at will using a code unit. Obviously, be careful um, and know that the when this gets executed, it's going to get executed as the user ID specified in the CRM connection setup. So, uh, outside of that, I think that's all I've got, and we are just about right on time. So, Abby, do we have any questions or comments before we wrap this up? Jeff, we do have just a couple of questions. Um, our first one, how does NAV integrate with CRM? How does NAV integrate with CRM? Um, well, it, essentially, the way that the connector works is that it's got a, uh, what is it called, a web services is, is how it, uh, I believe is the correct term. And the web services just provides a connection. Uh, and it's you provide a user ID and a password. And you provide, and that was all actually in this, in here. You provide this information, and everything else is basically behind the scenes. We're not allowed to touch anything else uh, from a development side of NAV. You don't get anything else. There is um, there is one uh, solution that you'll need to import into your CRM CRM environment that will handle the NAV connection from the other side, and it does a couple of other things. Um, but pretty much as far as setting up the just strictly the connection. That's what this page is for. Okay, great. And our other question, why does the NAV synchronization process take so long? <laughs> yes, why does it take so long? So um, that would be something you'd probably have to troubleshoot. Um, I can say that from my experience, the initial synchronization of where it's pushing uh, pushing new records or anytime it's doing modifications, from what I've seen, uh, I'll get I'll get an insert of a record from NAV into CRM usually in under five seconds. So if I've got a bunch of records that I'm inserting from NAV into CRM, it'll usually get about a record done every four or five seconds, maybe even down to three. But um, as far as as far as modifications, it's usually a lot faster than that. Um, if the if you're seeing that the nav uh, that the CRM to nav is taking a long time, that's where you want to get into the cleanup, and that's where I was talking about here on one of these last tips, right here. Take a look at code unit 5340, and I would recommend adding code like what I've done here. And basically, what you're doing is you're you're saying, hey, I don't want you to run this whole cleanup routine. Uh, especially while you're doing development work and testing out synchronizations and things, um, you don't want it running this. So find this area that I've got, uh, that I'm showing here in Code Unit 5340 and um, make the changes I've suggested and see if that helps. Um, if your integration from NAV to CRM is taking a long time as well, um, I would watch your job log, which is this. So if you take a look at your job log and just see, because you should be able to watch here by just um, keeping an eye on this and hitting F5, you should be able to watch your modified, inserted, unchanged, or failed records as it goes up. Just hit F5 while the job queue is running that, and you should be able to see what is it doing. Is it modifying a bunch of records? Are there a bunch of failures? Um, those kinds of things. Uh, the other thing you can do, which I did a ton of, is using the um, debugger, and I would run um, I would run this sync right here. So I would run the synchronized modified records from the integration table mappings. And so when you do that, you're running it as your user ID. And so then you can run the debugger against your own user session and see what's going on and troubleshoot it, watch it walk through the code, and see if there's a specific place where maybe it is taking a long time or just maybe you'll find that there's a whole section of code that it doesn't need to run, you don't want it to run. Those are the kinds of things I would look for. All right, excellent, Greg. I know that our very own James Strack wanted to make a quick comment about Navug. So, James, I will hand it over to you to quickly uh, 
talk, put in your shout out for Navog, and we'll wrap up. Thanks, Abby. Uh, thank you, Greg. I appreciate uh, you taking the time to do the webinar and pass on some great information. I did want to let everyone else know that you know Greg is also one of the leading members of the Wisconsin chapter of the NAV user group, mm -hmm. and this is the kind of information you receive when you join NAVOG and you become part of that community. Uh, and of course, you come to the Wisconsin chapter meetings, you have the opportunity to meet Greg and folks like him who are more than willing to share ideas and help you get the most out of your NAV product. So, thank Amen. you very much. Thank you, James. Thank you, sir.